So I ran a poll today on the channel overall to kind of gauge what kind of decks you guys play currently in MTG Arena. And I saw that some of you guys did say that you were still playing the starter deck. So in today's video, I want to dive into the starter decks in MTG Arena. Kind of give you guys an upgrade path onto how to go from the basic starter that you start with, maybe to something a little bit more competitive in that standpoint. With that being said, guys, hi everybody. Scar TV coming at you with another Magic the Gathering video. Like I said, we're going to be diving into some starter decks overall to kind of understand where we can go from the basic starter deck to a little bit more advanced. If you like this style of video, hit that like button. It definitely helps out a lot. If you're new here, want to know post new videos on the channel, hit that subscribe button. So let's dive into the starter decks and let's talk about it. So first and foremost, what we're going to do is we're going to dive into the base deck that you start out with, kind of talk about the deck overall as a whole, kind of see where areas that you can look at to the deck overall to kind of give you an understanding of maybe where to start when it comes to upgrading and then we're going to move on to the upgraded version of the deck and you can kind of see the difference of the deck overall and then in the, then in the deck list that i'm going to be posting in the channel i'll give you my rundown of what i removed to get to the finished upgraded deck so you can kind of give yourself an idea of what to get rid of and maybe add in in that manner whereas i mean it won't be a directly like get rid of this to add this it'll be more of here we minus these cards and then we added these cards and then the best way to go about it is probably to just uh you know gauge what you're getting rid of if you're getting rid of something that's a four cost maybe you know add in something that's a four cost kind of thing is my usual rule of thumb when it comes to adding and subtracting cards as you kind of build up your collection also with that being said guys i have i'm only going over three decks because i'm going to go into some details so i don't want the video to be super long so if there's a video if there's a particular starter deck that i didn't go over let me know which ones and i can you know work on those next after this video so that's also another thing but with that being said, we're going to be diving into the Mutation Station uh, deck, which essentially is a Mutate deck with a little bit of splash of some other things in this uh, board. And overall, the deck is pretty straightforward in what we're trying to do. We're trying to play around a few things. We have some cards to kind of help us, you know, hopefully control the, the game essentially on our side. But for the most part, we're playing around an ability called Mutate. Essentially, what Mutate is, if we cast a spell for its Mutate cost, put it under or over target non-human creature we own, Mutate the creature on top plus all the abilities from underneath it so essentially what would happen is if we put this sea dasher octopus if you're if you haven't played mutate before play for its mutate cost which is a blue and a colorless and we essentially either choose to put this on top of a non non-human creature or below it and essentially what would happen is if we put it above it, the creature now becomes a sea dasher octopus and it also has the ability of whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player draw a card and the idea of mutate essentially is we're trying to trigger these abilities every time we mutate so some of them have stagnant abilities that this is one whenever we deal damage so we can add that to a particular creature some of them are things that whenever we mutate like for example pounce and shore shark it's a card whenever we mutate uh we may return target creature or an opponent controls to its owner's hand it also has flash um and then we can choose to put it on top or bottom depending on the creature that we're putting it on and overall now like the one thing i would say based on this this is a pretty good start but there are some cards that i think that are kind of feel awkward and out of place overall and it's it's kind of my personal opinion for example you know they kind of give you an assortment of rares but i don't think a majority of the rares are actually that amazing for the most part outside of the mutate creatures for something like artist i don't think he really works with the deck sure this kind of helps us kind of you know making our opponent make a choice giving us you know either you know a card or we take a card and then we Put two in the graveyard or vice versa um but i don't think him as a you know a human creature really fits in the deck and i would say he's definitely probably a card you want to get rid of just because humans just don't work very well in this style of deck another one here is actually fairy raider it's only a one one for three mana and the benefit is you draw a card but i think a three mana cost one one is not very good uh you know you can kind of go into the end here masker worm feels a little bit awkward sure it's a worm so we can mutate onto it but you know the initial ability doesn't gain any benefit uh the more we you know mutate onto it so only when it comes into the battlefield is when we do the minus two minus two and i just don't think it really works for what we're trying to do as well same thing goes for lock mirror serpent uh sure it's a nice high-end mutate creature seven seven has flash we can sacrifice an island can make it unblockable we can sacrifice a swamp we gain a life and we draw a card and then we can exile five cards from an opponent's graveyard and return it to our hand um so i mean it's an okay card i just don't think it works in this particular kind of style of deck and then we kind of look in the bottom end and we look at the spells sure stern dismissal is a pretty decent bounce spell and you know it's one of those things that you could probably keep it in there but the only problem is once you bounce a particular creature and or enchantment it's just going to come back on the battlefield so it's one of those things that is kind of iffy and i know blue doesn't really have too much in the way of removal so that's one of those things that you may want to look for a different card if you're looking for something like removal. i would probably see to replace stern dismissal same thing goes for rookie mistake sure it's a pretty decent one cost instant 
card but the thing with it as well is it only gives plus zero plus two to uh one creature and another creature gets minus two minus zero so i i, I personally not a big fan either um because you know plus toughness is never going to really stop a creature from attacking in sure you know maybe the creature will attack for a little bit less but the thing is i don't think the minus minus and plus is going to be that great and that impactful and there's there's a few other things like boot nipper i actually don't mind because i do think the idea of getting the counter on something makes it definitely hard to get rid of with a heartless sack because the opponent has to get rid of can't get rid of the counter so boot, boot nipper is definitely a pretty decent counter to heartless act but i think he's overall pretty decent and i would say this is one of those things as you kind of like get towards the tail end of the upgrades this is probably something you eventually replace but this is something you don't immediately need to replace uh same thing goes for unexpected fangs i think you know giving things a plus one plus one counter and a lifelink counter on target creatures also pretty decent like i said with heartless act um giving something a little bit additional lifelink is pretty good but i would say this is one of those things you want to wait until the tail end uh mothra's great cocoon is very dependent on us playing mutate and mutating onto it I'm sure it's a zero two for one mana, which is not that bad. But you know, the idea here is it only gets better if we actually put mutate creatures onto it. So it's one of those things that you could probably at the end, once you're kind of arguing towards the tail end creature wise, is probably something you eventually want to get rid of. Now, when it comes to the actual creatures in the deck and kind of looking at what we have mutate wise in the deck, we look at a few things. The one thing I would say is Sea Dasher Octopus is actually pretty decent. It has flash, which is very good. And it gives target creature, you know, the ability to draw a card if it deals damage. Which is one of those things that's actually kind of interesting so we can actually flash this at instant speed which essentially is if you know say we attack him with some creatures and our opponent decides not to block one in particular we can actually mutate onto it at instant speed of the unblocked creature and then actually draw a card out of it which is i think is a pretty good effect another thing too is we got dirge bat which is one of the rares in the deck and i actually like this card in the sense that it's a pretty decent you know uh 3-3 three, three for 4 mana with flash and flying that we can play at any time. We can also mutate it at any time if we do get to the eventual 6 mana. Um, and then whenever it mutates, we get to destroy target creature or planeswalker and opponent controls. So essentially, once we start mutating this particular creature, we can actually start destroying you know creatures and or planeswalkers, which is actually pretty decent. And I think the idea here is you could also play for the cheaper converted mana cost and then mutate onto it. So then it eventually causes those triggers. Like I said, we do have a couple flash mutators. So we can do this at instant speed based on what our opponents do and maybe attacking wise and whatnot um going into like some of the other cards i mean outside of that there really isn't too much in the way of rares when it comes to mutate i mean it would just be playing more copies of things like chitter and harvester uh dream tail heron you know things that are just going to allow us to be able to mutate more and more and more because the thing is we want things that whenever we mutate kind of do x effect and i think that's the one benefit the other thing too is we got our baby godzilla or polywalk symbiote I'm sure i have the ultimate art but this is actually another thing that's going to make our mutate overall cost less and also the creature itself cost less so the initial cost of the cards actually going to be costing less and while the mutate is also going to cost less it allows us to draw so essentially it allows us to play a mutate creature uh converted mana cost and or mutate cost for less draw a card and discard a card which helps us get a little bit deeper and, and dig a little bit deeper into the deck and overall draw a little bit more advantage so with that being said i mean mutate deck is pretty good i think when mutate works and you're actually arguing mutate triggers turn after turn doing pretty consistent mutating you can definitely put your opponent in a very awkward position so moving on to the upgraded version of the deck you can overall see that deck really didn't change too too much what we did in the, with the deck overall to kind of add in some a little bit more consistency is we added in this one mana uh card called zagoth mamba it's a one mana one one whenever this creature mutates target opponent creature and opponent controls gets minus two minus two until the turn which I, I like the minus two minus two because there are a lot of things in the format right now that if you give it uh, give creatures indestructible especially in like mono white and given something that your opponent's trying to give indestructible minus two minus two actually counteracts that so if your opponent's creature goes below zero in toughness even if it has indestructible it still dies and i think having a one mana card that does that is actually pretty good and it's one of those things that triggers every time that they mutate so it's something that you can possibly trigger multiple times even in one turn if not throughout the course of the game definitely a pretty solid one drop you can kind of see here we kind of actually increase the amount of polywalk symbiotes to just go with a consistent four because it's something we kind of want to draw in the early game and hopefully draw it on curve so that we can definitely you know start ramping into our later game mutates um i actually added in heartless act to balance eliminates because because they kind of you know eliminates only good to three or less whereas heartless act can kind of target anything as long as it's on the counter um so i think that's the good fair balance with that uh we increased the seed asher octopus to two i know we could possibly have an idea of you know increasing it more um, but you know, I think the idea here is we increase things that trigger abilities that whenever they mutate and does stuff. I think this is one of those things that we can do it at a, at a fast speed for a cheap cost, maybe in the, in the later game to kind of surprise our opponent, because once we play a, uh, polywag symbiote, this does cost only one blue mana to actually mutate onto anything. 
like I said, we kind of increase the amount of, you know, things in our deck that have mutate whenever they trigger. Um, so we increase this to four copies just because yeah, I think this is actually a fairly good ability. You have something that has mutated, you know, four times, five times. Now we're making our opponent lose four life or five life and gain four or five life, depending on how many times that creature has mutated. So definitely one of those things. And every time that creature mutates further, it will actually, you know, trigger this more times, depending on how many more times it's mutated. Uh, we increase the amount of dirge best because this is like our other um, removal in the deck and you know have an ability that's going to have some sort of removal towards creatures and or planeswalkers is always a good thing to have like i said it's a balance of flash uh remove you know possible flash removal if we have anything like sea dash or octopus and or pounce and shore shark we increase the dream tail herons because i like the idea of whenever a cre this creature mutates you get to draw a card so i i think that's actually pretty good and it actually gives our, our creature flying but just like the dirge bat as well so we can give like a possible big creature flying, which makes it much more difficult for our opponent to deal with. Uh, so that's actually one of the reasons why we increased it to four copies. Pounce and Shore Shock, we brought up the three copies just because it's, yet again, it's a, a good ability to have a bounce effect. And I think having it combined into a creature uh, that has mutate is going to make it more effective. So it's definitely a good reason. Also it has flash and it's a bounce effect that returns target creature opponent controls back to their hand uh, for possible three mana, if not less, depending on how many uh, polywalk symbiotes we have. Uh, we added in Cavern Whisperer, which I don't think was in the deck to begin with. It's a 5 mana mut mutate creature that's a 4-4 menace, but it mutates for 4 mana. But whenever it mutates, your opponent has to discard a card. So depending on what kind of deck your opponent's playing, you know, hitting their hand and making them discard if they're not drawing a lot of cards or they're playing out a lot of things, is definitely going to hurt them in the long game because then they're eventually going to get to the point they just are in top deck mode. And, you know, if we're drawn pretty consistently, we're going to be able to take advantage of our opponent not having many options in their, their hand. Then we also have two Chin and Harvesters, which I think was already in the deck, but whenever this creature mutates, each opponent sacrifices a creature, so now we're making our opponent just sacrifice things whenever it mutates, and it mutates only for five mana, which is actually pretty good. Um, and, you know, just a big four, six body, you know, you start adding things like flying and menace and things like that, and it definitely becomes a very troubling creature to eventually block in a manner, and, you know, the idea of whenever it mutates, you know, we're going to trigger its ability here, and then whatever abilities are below it. Same thing goes for Archipelagor. I think this is the big finisher because, you know, essentially this is the thing we're going to play and we get to tap up to X target creatures or X the number of times this creature has mutated and those creatures don't untap during your opponent's follow and untap step. So essentially, you know, making our opponent tap down, especially playing something aggressive and then we can eventually, you know, probably swing in for the game at that point. So overall, I mean, this is the deck and I do think mutates are actually fairly interesting. I do think the one downfall with mutate is if your opponent's playing very uh, creature, you know, you know, removal, uh, very heavy creature removal you're going to have a hard time just because there's not really any good way to give uh, our creatures protection from particular things. So you may have to play around that. So that, that would probably be your weakest matchup, uh, you know, in mutate. I do think if you can, you know, draw mutates on curve and do fairly well, this deck actually performs pretty consistently. And in the mana base overall, we just swap the tap land, uh, you know, the tap dual land or the pathway just because more untapped mana is always good. Um, being able to not have to wait for tap mana to untap is definitely very good. And I just kept the one temple of seat. You can always remove it and maybe add in another planes or island but you know i'll let that up to you but i do think this is a pretty solid way to go from the deck that I, you start with in the game to kind of a little bit more something that probably can be a little bit more consistent overall now life skills is the next deck up on the list this is the the orzov deck that's the you know black and white uh deck that the whole goal here is we're doing things with life gain and things like that uh you know we're playing a bunch of cards that take advantage of us gaining life and overall and, you know, it helps us, you know, get things back in the graveyard, get creatures onto the battlefield, makes our opponent even lose life whenever they, whenever we gain life, which is actually pretty good. And, you know, the starter deck does an okay job, I think, at uh, doing that. I mean, there are some awkward cards that I think don't really work in the deck, but, you know, those are things you definitely should replace. So, I mean, overall, I don't think it's a terrible deck, but I do think there's a lot of room for improvement. I went kind of like a little bit more based on what was already here and kind of added a few things. And another idea that you could do with Orzov and Life Gain is you could actually go completely into Clerics, which is another idea. But I didn't really go that route. But I wanted to kind of stick to what the starter deck started out with, so there's less cards you have to craft overall. But I mean, overall, the deck actually has a pretty decent curve. I mean, it curves out probably to about four or five mana. Uh, I mean, the five mana is only like two creatures, but you know, the the, the top end is probably around four. So, I mean, these are reach creatures. You know, those are the big, the big finishers, the Bane Slayer Angel, the Clackwork Troll. We get those on the battlefield. If hopefully we're in a good position, definitely puts our opponent in a very awkward position. But the one card I do enjoy in life game that I do think is a pretty cool card that I don't think it's represented a lot is actually Vito. He's a three mana, one three. Whenever you, you, we gain life, your opponent loses that much life, which is 
kind of the way that I think the deck needs to revolve around. So that when I go to the upgraded version, you kind of see how I added in more things that kind of help us get to this effect. And the idea here is you can tap five at some point in the game and make all our creatures gain lifelink and at some point just swing all in. Because the, the interesting thing I think that I feel like a lot of people underestimate is that even if we don't hit our opponent in the face with these lifelink creatures, though, any of those creatures that deal damage to other creatures and they have lifelink and as long as our opponent doesn't have some sort of way to either remove the creature lock in and or you know have first strike that kills our creature in the process we're gonna we're gonna hit our opponent for that much life in the process so that's actually one of those interesting things that kind of works out so even if we didn't actually hit our opponent in the face we're gonna hit their creatures we're gonna gain the life and then we're gonna deal that much damage to them anyway so it's definitely a very interesting way to finish out the game so we're just gonna go through the deck real quick and just kind of go over every card anointed Ch 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 Chorister Chorister is a human cleric for one man it's a one one lifelinker in the later game, if we had a lot of mana, you can tap five mana, give a plus three, plus three into under turn. It's an interesting card. It's it's okay. I don't think it's super amazing, especially if we're not going the cleric route. I do this think this is one of those cards you could probably remove in the early game. You got Light's Hope, which is definitely a pretty interesting card because it's pretty versatile. You, give, you can gain four life. You can destroy target enchantment, which is pretty decent. I don't know how many enchantment decks are floating around at the moment. And the idea to put a plus one, plus one counter on target creatures is actually pretty good. Because the idea here is, I've actually done this before, if you actually put a plus one plus one counter on a creature that's in Heartless Act before the Heartless Act resolves, you can actually counter the Heartless Act and the Heartless Act fizzles out when they can't do anything about it. Another interesting card from the deck is actually Speaker of Heavens. Uh, if we can gain enough life, we can get to 27 life, we can actually start producing Angel Tokens, which is definitely very interesting and definitely puts a lot of pressure on our opponent if they can't deal with it overall. Uh, after that, we got Shadow Spear, which is another interesting card here because it gives Equip Creature plus one plus one and has Trample and Lifelink which is our other way of actually getting through for damage to opponent's face and triggering some other things in the deck if we give something lifelink. The other thing that I think a lot of people underestimate that actually this has is we can tap one mana and permanence your opponent's control, lose hexproof and indestructible in a turn. So this is one of those things that I actually think a lot of people underestimate. I do think it's kind of, it's cause it's kind of awkward in best of one, but the idea to give something, make it lose hexproof and or indestructible is, is, is it interesting ability in the fact that there's a lot of things in mono white that kind of gives things hexproof slash indestructible um well i guess it's not hexproof it's protection so i guess that doesn't count and if you ever get paired up against a deck that plays like dream trawler this is actually something that makes their dream trawler kind of weird in the sense that now they can't give it hexproof in any sort of way um even if they discard a card because it, this i think is a static ability so they can't actually override if i discard a card if i'm not mistaken let me know down in the comments below if i'm wrong and I think it's an interesting way just to give, you know, your creatures just a way to get through some extra damage. And if they don't have lifelink on them, it gives them lifelink. So that's also pretty good. And it's on the fairly cheap side. So there's only a one-up in the deck. Erebos' Intervention is another interesting card here because, like, the other uh, cards in, like, the, the Mutate deck that I said before, giving the creature minus X minus X is another way to get around Indestructible. And the idea here is that we also gain life in the process. So that's definitely pretty good. And the idea also to, you know, XL uh, up to twice X cards from part from from graveyards is actually also good in the sense that you know if we're playing against a matchup that your opponent's re recurring things back from the graveyard you can just get rid of their graveyard and your opponent just has to doesn't have anything to get back so if they play something like Luris, this is definitely a good target for that so definitely Erebus's inventions is a card that you probably want some more of you know just based on the overall meta as a whole griffin area is one of those interesting cards here in the sense that whenever we gain three or more life on our turn at our end step, we get to create a 2-2 white griffin creature token with flying. And this is where it actually gets kind of interesting because if we have this out and we can equip the Shadow Spear to our griffin we're creating, that, that griffin, as long as it doesn't die, is actually going to be able to produce more griffins going forward. So every time that griffin attacks, now it gains life, we're going to be able to just automatically get a griffin to replace it, if not get another griffin on the battlefield overall. Again, we got Revitalize, which is another interesting card here. It's a gain three life, draw a card. Triggers Griffin Airy, gets us a card draw, instant speed, so we can do that anytime. Definitely a good card to possibly play in the deck just to help us gain some life. Then you got Boot Nipper, yet again, he makes an appearance in this deck. I do think there's some cards that do have, you know, kind of bleed over from, you know, the various starter decks. But you got Boot Nipper, and the idea here is that you can enter the battlefield with the choice of a lifelink and death touch counter because it's a lifelink deck. Uh, the lifelink counter is pretty good to help us out there. Death touch, death touch is actually pretty good too if your opponent you know is attacking pretty aggressively and something to block with to hopefully try to kill in the process but on the most points you can always add the lifelink counter to it but he's also one of those creatures that's kind of flexible if we need him or not probably he's one of those creatures he probably flex out towards the end you have tavern swindler which is a very interesting card here the fact that we can pay three life we can flip a coin if we win the flip we gain six life but it's a it's a it's a very gambly kind of move and it's only a two mana two two which is not too bad but i think the idea of risking life to try to gain life in the process is definitely 
very chancy and just the way sometimes i personally feel how magic magic arena is i feel like you're gonna lose more times than you're gonna win uh the flip so i would say this is one of those cards that i would probably avoid playing it and probably get rid of it just because the life gain is not very consistent yet again you get unexpected fangs yet again another card that i think is pretty decent um you know is one of those cards you probably want to get rid of towards the end but you know the overall idea plus one plus one counter life link counter is pretty decent for the life link deck overall then you get silver silver's moat pool which is three mana three one at the beginning of our end step we gain three or more life this turn because we're turning from our graveyard to the battlefield tapped and then we can tap two mana sacrifice it and we can draw a card so it's actually one of those things it's another way to draw some cards um definitely very interesting here um i don't know you know I, I think the two is fine it's a pretty decent card it only has one toughness which is downfall but i do like the idea that you can sacrifice it depending on where you, where you need cards to possibly draw it in the game um so i i do like that ability like i said there's veto veto is a good card he's like the the life gain lord i guess because you know the ability that it's going to deal that much damage to our opponent whenever we gain life so definitely very good there then we got the indulgent patrician it's a three mana one four fly and life linker at the beginning of our end step of gain three or more life each opponent loses three life so if you have veto out plus this you know your opponent's gonna you know they're gonna actually get dealt the three damage plus the three damage on top of that and then another three damage at the end of turn definitely something that can be very annoying when you start having these triggers that if we've done certain things 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 happen to our opponent and definitely puts our opponent in a very awkward position overall then you have fate's feathers which is another interesting card here it's a way to kind of you know stop that creature from attacking and or blocking and its active abilities can't be activated unless they're mana abilities um and it actually enchants any permanent so the weird the interesting thing here which i is one of those things that you probably don't think about is that planeswalker abilities are technically activated abilities so you can technically enchant a planeswalker now they can't actually you know plus or minus it if i'm not mistaken and the idea here as well you gain four life or four mana and then you get to possibly trigger some of your other life gain abilities that happen on the stack so definitely a pretty interesting card here um then you got baked into a pie it's a four mana removal spell that helps us also create a food token it's okay i do think there's better removal i think four mana is kind of steep and i don't think getting the food token out of it is is very good in the sense that i think there's a lot better things you know that produce food tokens that you could probably get for cheaper um, but I mean, it's an okay removal for the early game until you start probably flexing and getting more of the other removal spells that there are in MTG Arena. Then you have Resolute Rider. It's a four mana, four two. You can give it lifelink at the end of the turn, and Resolute Rider also gains Indestructible for three mana. So it's one of those things that you can kind of choose depending on what you need. Um, I do think it's kind of on the pricey side for four two. I think the abilities are kind of very cost heavy. I mean, unless you're in the late game, you don't really have a hand. I, I, I guess it's worth it to possibly tap it, depending on what the situation is. But I honestly, he's also one of those cards that's very awkward for the cost and what he really does. I just don't think it's that amazing overall. And then you have Baneslayer Angel, which is a five mana, five, five flying first strike life blinker protection from demons and dragons. I, I like this card because, you know, you can first strike life link. So essentially you can hit something first, gain life, and then if you know if it you deal more damage to it then it's toughness it's gonna die but if it doesn't at least you gain the life in the process also has flying which makes it very versatile you know it blocks a lot of things in the game currently so overall i think i do like bane slayer angel then you also got clack bridge troll which is another interesting card here it has trample haste and whenever it enters the battlefield the opponent gains three zero one goat tokens and at the beginning of your combat step any opponent may sacrifice a creature if a player does tap clack bridge troll gain three life we draw a card so this actually puts our opponent in a very awkward position because we're going to start playing Cla we're going to play clockwork troll they're going to get three go tokens and if you have something like veto out on the battlefield every time they now sacrifice one of those go tokens they're just looking to at least take three three life because we're going to gain three life from this ability and on top of we're going to also draw a card so we're digging a little bit deeper into our deck and i do think this is one of those cards that's very interesting if your opponent doesn't decide to now they have to deal with a 88 trample haster for five mana so it's like one of those things that's a it's a you know your opponent has to kind of really figure it out if they don't have an answer to deal with they're probably more than likely to sacrifice a goat and it's definitely interesting like the results that could happen from this and then overall the mana base is pretty straightforward it's 25 lands 10 planes 10 swamps four scoured barons and four temple or one temple of silence so i mean overall the deck i think is in a decent spot i i think there's ways to improve it to make it overall better by playing more copies of certain things well, as well add in some other cards that didn't make uh, i guess initially when they decided to craft the starter decks so going into my version of what i did in this deck overall to kind of you know get it to a place where i think it's a little bit better i mean it's not anything too too crazy i think the deck overall didn't really change too too much but i think it's i think in a better place so you know what i did is i increased speaker of heavens to four copies i do think this is one of those things that you kind of want to get out and hopefully start gaining some life 
Sure, I mean the one bit, the one downfall since we're not playing like the like a mono white version is that we're not, we don't play a lot of ways to protect it. But if we can kind of get this ability or being like throughout the game and play in the later game, we can start pumping out four four angel tokens that our opponent now has to deal with. I do think it's actually pretty good. The other thing I did is I actually increased the copies of Erebus Intervention just one more, so now there's two copies in the deck. Just because I do like the idea here that you know even if your opponent you know is low in life and we can actually tap X for whatever mana we have open even if the creature is only like a 3-3 so we tap it for like eight mana we're gonna give the target creature minus eight minus eight then we're gonna gain eight life combine that with something like veto then we're gonna do eight damage to your opponent so definitely i think it's one of those cards that kind of possibly finish off the game depending on what your opponent's situation is overall i increase the copies of griffin airy i increase copies of revitalize i do think these two cards here um you know are definitely benefit from you just having extra copies i think you then draw this more consistently possibly curve to hopefully get you know this going in the early game to eventually produce a lot of tokens um you know i increased the copies of veto to four copies sure it's a legendary you could possibly get away with three but i did want to try to draw this consistently because we do want to get that effect of our opponent whenever we gain in life our opponents lose that life i added one more copy of the patrician just because you know it's a pretty decent uh blocker because it's a one four with life link which is actually pretty good and that ability you know getting that out and getting our opponent lose three life and gain three life is actually pretty good other than that, I mean, the top end here has not really changed too, too much. Uh, we still keep the two copies of Fate's Feathers, but then we went to uh, two copies of Bane Slayer. Um, you know, it's one of those things that kind of balanced out the top end. So we have two Bane Slayers. We have two Black Witch Trolls because the ability is actually pretty decent. Though I didn't want to increase the copies because you don't want to draw it all the time. You only want to draw it really, you know, when we get to that point in the game. So you don't want to draw multiple copies. We just want to draw like the one copy, possibly when we get to turn five, hopefully. And then on top of it, I figured that this is actually kind of interesting. Sure, we don't gain life from its ability, but I do think this is interesting combined with the idea of Clackbridge Troll. So if we play Clackbridge Troll and we get the three go tokens, your opponent sacrifices one, but maybe they're also playing like an aggro deck. We then play the Massacre one possibly on the next turn after if we draw on it. And now we're going to give all creatures your opponent controls minus two, minus two. Uh, so if they're playing small creatures or the goats die, that player is going to lose two life for each creature that died this way. Um, and then on top of it now, they're going to have less creatures to possibly sacrifice to then tap the Clackbridge Troll, which I think is a pretty decent combo. And I think it's one of those things to kind of, you know, put your opponent in a weird position of them having to choose possibly a creature that didn't die from this. And then on top of it, it you know, it wipes the board out essentially if they play little small creatures. Other than that, the only other thing I really changed in the deck is I just put in some, you know, pathways just because untapped mana makes the deck, uh, you know, run smoother, which makes it overall perform better. So, I mean, that's pretty much my version of life skills upgraded. I do think there's probably some playability that you can actually put in here. Like I said, at one point, I initially tried to make this deck and I just went all clerics, which I felt like completely gutted what the deck was originally trying to do. So I kind of kept, I kind of went with this version just because it kind of keeps intact what the starter deck was really trying to do initially. Now, this last deck here is actually a deck that I, I think to kind of give a little bit of a different spin on the overall kind of style of what cards I was going after. And I went with the, the spell power deck, which is essentially I think is a deck that's a little bit more spell focused than really creature focused, like the other two decks I kind of went over in today's video. And I do think this deck is fairly interesting. I do like the idea of playing like is it in a way and just playing a bunch of spells to kind of get certain abilities that trigger. And I and you know it's pretty interesting what the deck is trying to set up. I do think that this deck just misses that mark because I you know, I don't think it has enough to really, you know, hit your opponent that hard. Um, but I do think there's certain pieces in the deck that overall make it pretty good. So we look at the one drops here. And Merfolk's Secret Keeper is actually kind of one of those interesting things here. Because the idea here is that I think they thought that you bill yourself for four cards. But, you know, possibly four, you know, four cards in your graveyard. Because the deck pick benefits from you having spells in your graveyard or instants and sorceries in your graveyard. So I guess is they thought you'd bill yourself for four, which is a very weird thing for a point for a person to do especially a newer player to do and i mean sure you get the zero four wall out of it but i don't think you know that ability is very very good so this is something i would definitely replace probably very early opt is a very solid card because you scry so you get to look at the top card you get to choose if you like that card to draw it if you don't you just throw it on the bottom and you get to draw a card at random so i do like opt which is a pretty strong card then you got shocked which i feel like has gone to the wayside just because you know just frostbite from uh, call time that came out but i do like the ability that shock is in the deck because it can target anything so even your opponent's life total so i, I decided to keep the actual shock in like the upgraded version of the deck just because of its ability to target anything you get anticipate which is another interesting card in the deck um it's, it's a speed to two, uh two mana card that allows you to look at top three cards of our library we have to put one of our one of them into our hand the rest in the bottom of our library in any order which is essentially is like a scry three draw one kind of thing but you don't get to put anything on the bottom before you draw 
but I do like the idea here that at instant speed you can technically draw a card and throw two cards on the bottom of your library, which is definitely pretty good. And you got Riddle Form, which is a card that benefits from us playing non-creature spells. And it's kind of weird when you look at the various decks. It's kind of weird when they where they choose the uncommons and commons and how many copies they give. Because I think this is one of those cards that actually really benefits from us having you know multiple copies of in the deck. And this is something I did increase in my version of the deck just because I do like the idea that you know on on our opponent's turn whenever we're ready to actually turn into a creature we can turn into a blocker possibly and on our turn we can you know we can always trigger the ability to turn into a creature as well so it's definitely pretty good and the later game if we're kind of you know looking for a particular card we can start scrying the top of our library by tapping mana you have a dalian arcanist which is a two mana one three it's you can tap it we can spend colorless mana spend this mana to only cast instant sorcery spells so i do like the idea that you know this is like our ramp spell for the deck but it's only colorless mana which doesn't help us out as a whole because sure there's cards in our library that have a colorless mana symbol in the cost but there's not many in 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 that sense so it's definitely a very it's a very particular card so i don't think it's a very strong card for what we're trying to do sure it's a one three which makes it an okay blocker but you know it's going to be it's going to cast very few and far between spells just because of that awkward you know only producing colorless mana um, so I do think this is one of those things that you probably throw to the wayside at some point whenever you decide to upgrade. And you got Forbidden Friendship, which is another interesting card here. And the one thing I do like about this is that you produce, uh, you know, two creatures, a 1-1 one -one dinosaur creature with haste and a 1-1 one -one human soldier creature with haste. And I do think it's interesting, but I, I, I'm not really sure where they were trying to go with this payoff. Um, I mean, there is double vision in the deck, which is a card I'll talk about as I get there, which copies a spell. But I, I'm not really sure what the big payoff is by producing, you know, additional tokens on the battlefield because... You know, if you're not playing anything like Transmogrify or trying to do anything special with those tokens or pumping up those tokens, they're just 1-1 tokens, which just make decent chump blockers, but don't really anything more than just that. We got Scorching Dragonfire, which is another interesting card here. It's a very, you know, particular removal spell in the sense that it's a two mana, destroy, deal three damage to target creature or planeswalker, and that creature or planeswalker would die, exile instead. So it's, it's particular in the sense that it can only target creatures, so I do like it. Um, I think I went a different way with this two mana slot with the removal, but I do enjoy the idea of, you know, having something that can just, you know, hit something pretty hard and exile in the process. And it's stolen by the Fae, which is another interesting card here. It's an X two mana. You can return target creature with a converted moss X to its owner's hand. Create X very creature token flying. I'm not, I don't really feel great about this card because I would like, I would like the ability instead of it being X. So it has to be specifically X. I would like the ability if it read it a little bit differently. I mean, I don't know if it would make it more mythic, but I don't like the idea that you, you have to lock it into that converted mana cost. So, I mean, if you tapped it for, let's just say you had nine mana on the battlefield, you tapped it for eight or for seven, I guess, because two of the costs actually cast a spell. I would actually like the, if the ability read to then Benny, you know, found something back to your opponent, that owner's hand that costs seven or less, I think it would make it much better because there's no real way to take advantage of tap in X. Because, you know, unless your opponent's playing big creatures, I mean, most most creatures, you maybe bounce it back to their hand, maybe one, two, three mana. And I don't really think in the big payoff of, you know, bouncing bouncing a three mana creature, even if you copy it, I don't think it makes it overall strong. And again, you know, three one ones out of it. I, I would say you want to take advantage of getting more counters. So I don't really like this as a bounce spell. I do think this is like a wasted slot. I just think they want to throw a rare in there and they went with this one. And you got Frost Breath, which is actually pretty interesting. It's kind of like one of those things to kind of tap down your opponent's creatures so you can slow down if they're being very aggressive. So I don't, I do like that. And I think this is one of those decks that we kind of, kind of need some time to build up a little bit to like turn three, turn four. So if you're playing against something super aggressive, I do like a way to kind of fog the board or if your opponent doesn't have a lot of creatures, just kind of tap things down so you can kind of, you know, gain momentum in a sense. So a pretty decent slowdown card for a kind of like spell style deck. You got Wave Break Hipp Hippocamp, which is another interesting card here. It's a three mana two two, and whenever we cast the first spell on, during each opponent's turn, draw a card. I mean, it's okay. Yet again, it's a very awkward rare. I don't. I, I'm not a big fan. This is one of those cards I definitely remove the deck. Um, it just feels out of place in a sense that it's just some of the some of the cards in this deck just don't feel really that strong. It just feels like they're just thrown in there just to kind of fill that quota of hitting the rare. Uh, Brazen Borrower is a very good card. I do like the ability that the the one side's Petty Theft, which you can bounce target permanent back to its owner's hand for two mana, and then and after you do that, you can always play for the three mana uh, flyer that has flash. But the only downfall is that you can only block creatures with flying. But I do like the idea that you have a dual dual ability, so I do think this is one of those ones you want more copies of than just the one. And you get Spell Eater Wolverine, which is another instant card here. This is one of those things that takes advantage of us having you know multiple instances of sorceries in our graveyard. And I, I can kind of see that's why the Merfolk Secret Keeper is here. But yet again, I don't want to throw things in the graveyard and not actually try to play them. So that's one of those reasons why I don't think the 
see if the paper works. But I do think you get to a point by turn three that you may have played two or three spells at that point. And then by the time you this actually gets to swing in and attack, I do think that this is something that you can take advantage of that. And yet spell forger weird. Um the name's very weird. It's also a weird creature, I guess. Um, it's a three mana two two, and whenever we cast a non-creature spell, put a plus one plus one counter on spell gorge or weird. Yet again, I as much as I like the card, there's an uncommon that's a sprite dragon. Um, that I think is a much better version of it because one has flying, it also has haste. Sure, it's only a one one, but I do like the idea here that you know it's cheaper in the sense that it costs two mana. You get a one one out of it, has exactly the same ability, and can also attack and the turn it immediately comes down to the battlefield. That's where I kind of went with, and I got rid of these just because I do think the sprite sprite dragon is just that much better. Um, then you get the experimental overlord, which is another interesting card. It's a four mana card that created an XX blue and red weird creature, so it creates more weird creatures. Uh, where X is the number of instant sorcery cards in the graveyard, then you may return target instant sorcery card from graveyard to your hand, exile experimental overlord. So I do like the idea here that you know, as we get into later game, your graveyard is going to fill up with instant and sorceries. And at some point you're gonna get like a four, four, five, five, six, six, depending on how many instances of sorceries. And then on top of it, you get to return back one of those instances of sorceries back to your hand to possibly cast it. So if it's like a removal spell that you need, bounce spell, or even a draw a card spell, I do think this card is definitely good in that sense because it has a big payoff of get, besides getting the creature, we're now getting it back to spell as well to take, you know, use against our opponent. And then in the top end here, we have Storming Entity, which is a very good card, I think, for the deck. Um, and this is definitely something you want to, you know, get more copies of because just like, is it in general, like is, is it aggro deck? This is something that, you know, is going to take advantage of us playing non-creature spells. So as flying prowess, it costs three less, which is two colors in a blue cast. Yes, if we play an instant sorcery, so you play an op before it, you play a shock before it, pay for two mana instead of five mana. And then when it enters the battle, we get to describe the top two cards that are library. So we can kind of set the next couple turns if we're not, if we're looking for more non-creature spells or possibly even more uh, threats for the board. So definitely a pretty good card and i do like this prowess ability you got double vision which is another interesting card in the deck because this is going to help us trigger multiple abilities of things um if we get into the late game i can't remember if i actually kept it in my upgraded version i'm just thinking off the top of my head i won't really know until i look at it but this is definitely something a cool way to kind of copy spells to get you know double spell you know abilities so essentially you can you know cast a frost breath it casts two copies of that frost breath uh, if it's the first spell we cast it on each turn and it's not just our turns each turn so we can do it on our opponent's turn and our turn and we're going to get double uh, the copies of that particular spell and we get to choose new copies for that target which in the end game is going to be a good way for us to take advantage of things that you know whenever we cast an on creature spell we're going to get plus and plus one counters or so on and so forth you know multiple experimental overlords are going to get multiple weird creatures multiple cards back from our graveyard so on and so forth then you got shark typhoon which is a, another interesting card here um I, I didn't add any more copies to the deck. I think I kept the one copy in the deck um, because you can slam it for the six mana, which essentially whenever we cast a non-creature spell, we get an XX shark token where X is that spell's converted mana cost. And the deck plays a fairly, you know, decent array of spells of, you know, two, three, four, even one. So we're going to start producing some sharks that way. But in certain situations, you can also catch your opponent off guard by tapping X and cycling the card um, for two mana. Um, and then we're going to get a shark token for whatever X mana we, we cast and we get to kind of do it at instant speed and your opponent can't counter that ability and we get to draw a card out of it. So it's definitely one of those two things that you can kind of do depending on the situation. So if you really need a blocker and you want to catch your, you maybe want your opponent attacks or something you really want to, you know, get from the battlefield, surprise them with a shark and put it in its way. All right. At the same time, if you draw in the later game, you can always slam it on the battlefield and then whenever we start casting non-creature spells, we're going to start pumping out sharks like crazy. So it's definitely one of those cards that definitely is pretty decent overall. Uh, then you got Boon of the Wish Giver, which is uh, two copies of it in the deck, if I'm not mistaken. And it's interesting here in the deck. It is kind of like that big draw card kind of spell. Um, you know, it's sorcery speed, draw four cards. <sighs> you know, I just I just don't think it's amazing, amazing. Uh, I mean, sure, you can cycle it for one man and draw a card. But I do think there's probably better draw cards that are even commons. If For the most part, if you're not playing Cycling, I don't really know why you're playing Boon of the Wish Giver. Um, or something with like a very deep mana curve. Sure, I mean, in the late game, if you have something like double vision out, you're gonna draw multiple, you can possibly draw eight cards if you really want to, but at the same time too, you're tapping six mana to draw those eight cards. Probably not gonna have the open mana to really play anything else. So it's definitely one of those awkward cards in the deck, just because I just don't think the, the benefit of tapping that much mana to get four cards is really worth it. And like I said, the mana base overall is the same that it started out with, you know, 10 of each land, one four copies of Sweetwater Cliffs, and one so it's definitely a you know an overall pretty decent deck i like i said i do think there's just awkward cards in the deck that just don't really work 
And I just think they're thrown in there just to kind of, you know, fill that space and just want to, you know, throw in other cards in the process. So now we're going to look at my copy of the deck. And I mean, overall, the deck really doesn't change too much. I do add in a couple of things to kind of give some other kind of abilities in the deck just based on, you know, my knowledge and kind of what I've seen. Um, so in the in the one drop slot, we don't really have a one drop, but we went with four copies of Opt and two shocks. So nothing really changed there. I think I did increase one copy of Opt. Uh, in the two drop slot, we actually increased the copies of Riddle Form to, you know, three copies, which I think is a pretty solid, you know, spot for a Riddle Form. You know, it's one of those things that, you know, you want. it's a non-creature spell, so cast a Riddle Form to make another Riddle Form not be a Riddle Form. So definitely very good there. But outside of that, you know, you want to draw maybe just the one or two to be on the battlefield, but you don't need, you know, all four copies of uh another card that i added in here that i do enjoy is blitz of the thunder raptor i think it's slightly better than um you know the scorch and dragon fire just on the basis of you know this is one of those abilities that we're trying to pump you know spells and sorceries into the graveyard and this deals x damage to target creature or planeswalker uh based on the amount of those sorcery instance in the graveyard so this thing can actually hit for a lot of damage and, and on, in turn it actually does the same thing and exiles that card instead so Definitely one of those cards that I do think is pretty decent, especially if we can start stacking our graveyard full of instant sorceries. It kind of will get rid of essentially anything that could be pretty big in our way. So I kind of copied something from my Is It Combo deck in the style of I think only Shuri is actually pretty decent here. Kind of combining that double vision type stuff. And the idea here that what we're trying to do here is we're going to try to, you know, put it on something like a Sprite door, uh, you know, Sprite Dragon or Storming Entity or any of our creatures in general, even a Spell Eater or Wolverine because it could get double strike. And essentially what we want to do is we want to double that target of that creature until end of turn, and then possibly even combine it with the next card in the library, which is dual strike, which is another instant uh, spell. We can foretell this for, you know, the two colorless. And whenever we cast the next instant or sorcery spell, we give mana cost four or less. Uh, copy that spell. You may choose new copies for that spell for one red mana. So for five mana, we can pair, we can essentially cast our most expensive spell in the deck outside of shark typhoon or double vision. Um, and we get an extra copy of it and then we get to trigger it twice so essentially you can copy any of our spells in our library and do, do them twice which if you have something like an unleashed fury you can essentially double the creature's power twice so essentially you can do let's just say the creature's a 4-4 four, four, it goes to an 8-8 eight, eight, then it goes to a, goes to a or goes from a 4-4 four, four to like a 8-4 uh, and then to a 16-4 and possibly at that point you get your opponent off guard hit them for a lot of damage hit them in one big shot like i said i like sprite dragon over that other thing um, so we added four copies of that because I do enjoy the, I do like the benefit of having fly and haste, the plus one plus one counter every time we cast a spell. Sure, it's a one one, but you know we could probably get it up pretty big pretty quickly. But then we went with two copies of Brace and Borrower. I didn't want to increase too many copies just because it is a mythic, and you know you're trying to just upgrade the starter deck. You're not trying to invest a whole ton into it, just kind of get it maybe a little bit more competitive. So we only went with two copies because of the the solid ability of both effects. I uh, kept the same amount of. Sp uh, spell eater wolverines i think it's an okay uh card in the three drop slot um you know the ability to possibly have double strike as long as they have three or more instances of sorceries which is very plausible with the deck based on how many instances of sorceries we have in the library so definitely pretty good it's a three two for three mana um and then on top of it, we got lord dracus which i think is one of those cards that i kind of threw in there just because i do like the idea here you can throw it on any creature um because none of our creatures are humans of course um and give it uh you know make target creature a two three instead of whatever the base power and toughness is uh, but on top of it, we get the ability of getting um, target instant or sorcery card back from our graveyard to our hand. So like, if we need a possible another Unleashed Fury to finish off the game, or maybe maybe our opponent made us discard a dual strike and get back a dual strike, and then kind of set something up in the later game. The other thing too is anything with a plus one plus one counter, like, okay, so Sprite Dragon I think is the only thing in the deck with a plus one plus one counter. Um, we can put the base power and toughness over this, and whatever plus one plus one counters are on Sprite Dragon, you essentially will gain that much power so it will go from being a, a 1 1 base power and toughness or 1 1 base power and toughness to a 2 3 base power and toughness plus the x amount of plus one plus one counters on top of it already so if it's a 3 3 which means it has two plus one, plus one counters now four dracus is now a 4 5 which is definitely you know very good in the sense that it kind of protects our sprite dragon from possibly getting removed from like something like a shock or something like that and of course we still have three copies of experimental overlord which is very solid and I didn't really change anything up too much here. I did get rid of uh, the boon of the wish, the boon of the wish giver. I had one extra copy of Storming Entity just because he is like our top end guy. I'm sure, he's not really super top end because he can each come cheaper if we cast an on creature spell. But I do like this list on what it's trying to do. And I added in the pathways because, yeah, yeah, like I said, a deck like this style of deck wants to be aggressive and not have any any off turns and play tap mana. 
because we have an off turn if we especially in the early game when we're still trying to get up ramp up our mana to the pot to the right amount of mana to be able to cast multiple things so we just went with pathways just because it's much better than tap lanes in general and i kept one copy of double vision because you know it's nice if we can draw this and possibly get on the battlefield and get multiple copies of spells that we're casting but it's not something you really need to have run many of because you don't want to draw too many of them and then it creates a very awkward situation in that sense but i mean this is that spell that spell power upgraded which i do like i played around with it it does perform pretty well it does have that explosive you know surprise that your opponent may not catch but you know let me know down in the comments below what you guys think uh of the decks i went over in today's video which one's your favorite are you playing any of the ones i kind of went over already do you have something similar like i said let me know in the comments below with any of the feedback if you want to know if you want me to you know look at particular starter decks and up and look to upgrade those and make upgrade videos for those let me know which ones down in the comments below if, if you're if you like the video hit that like button it definitely helps out a lot if you're new here want to know why posting videos on the channel hit that subscribe button but i'll see you in the next video